Polypropylene, we are not going to get through this without any innuendos, are we? Polypropylene is probably one of the most ubiquitous plastics out there. It's in bottles, not these ones, these are pets. It's in the caps of the bottles though, maybe this one I can't tell. It's in packaging, it's in food things, it's in lunch boxes, it's in DVD cases, those are still a thing I guess. Basically it's in anything that's bendy and plastic, especially if it's slightly transparent or completely transparent, then it's probably PP or PET or some kind of version in between. So given that this stuff is not expensive in 2025, which it isn't, this might be news to you actually, um, Sunlu have sent me this reel over for me to use, it's brand new, it's not even on sale yet so I don't know the price. I've asked and I've told it will be out in September, which is almost here already. I've also bought some Everyone PP just online, this stuff is under £30 a reel so I presume that's about the, the price point that, that Sunlu are probably going to be aiming for. I actually prefer the Sunlu one for reasons we'll get to, the transparency, um, but they're both absolutely fine. It's not the expensive price as it used to be, which honestly never made any sense as it's such a commodity plastic in the first place. So now that we can buy it easily and it's very blatantly better than a lot of other plastics at a lot of things. Why aren't we using it? That's what we need to talk about because I think we're all sleeping on what could be one of the best plastics currently available for 3D printing. Primarily because of our perception and hang-ups on how hard it is to print. Let's go. I think the MSDS on polypropylene is probably the best place to start as the initial thought most people, self-included, have when encountering what could be probably called an engineering plastic. I don't know if it is or not, that's a term that means what you want it to mean, but the initial thought is that polypropylene must be terrible to print in the home, and that must be why nobody's doing it, but actually, kind of no. As far as I can tell, and this is not advice, because the real advice, as I've told you before, is that you should always replace the air in your room six times or more every hour, and that does include PLA, but polypropylene doesn't seem provably worse than PLA. It notably doesn't emit styrenes like ABS and ASA, it doesn't emit capsaicin like nylon, Go on, correct me in the comments, you know you want to. However, it does emit unknown quantities of formaldehyde type stuff. Bad news for you though, so does PLA. Notably, in my experience, at least the neutral non-coloured stuff, also, it doesn't even smell of anything. So, this makes it a pretty compelling plastic to add to whatever you keep your filament on. Top of the printer in my case. At least it's a compelling plastic to use until you realise it doesn't stick to anything. This is great because when you have a spaghetti error in your printer, it almost never even sticks to the hot end. The funny thing is it sticks to the bed at first pretty well, even on PEI sheet, just standard bed surface, just long enough for you to think, okay, I'm good at this. I, all the advice out there is wrong. You can print PP on PEI sheets. Great, the internet is misinforming me as usual and you walk away and then nope, a couple of layers up, it just warps and it pops off every single time. One of the reasons it does warp and pop off so much more than any other material is actually really interesting. This is where, as per the tradition of the channel, we wander off into the weeds a bit, so if you're that person who is going to comment saying I wasted 0.73 minutes of your time showing you something cool, now's your chance to skip ahead. The rest of us, I want to show you something very polarising. Polarizing microscopy. If you're a Posey fan, you will have seen half of this story already. Here's the other half. If you polarise your light source so that all the light is this isn't a physics channel, you know what a polarizer is. You polarize the light source and then you shine that polarized light through some polypropylene. It does nothing at all. Fascinating. Sorry about that, I thought it would do something. Maybe, maybe skipping was a good idea in the first place. Anyway, as polypropylene cools, the polymer chains will begin to organize into a more ordered crystalline structure. This process causes a significant amount of shrinkage. I'm totally not reading that off Wikipedia. The first layer that's laid down adheres to the print bed, but then as subsequent layers are added and cooled, they are shrinking, and that is causing the whole thing to curl up so much more than normal. It is not the only plastic to have a semi-crystalline structure, but it is the only one that I've got in front of a polarized light source right now that also happens to be somewhat transparent. Now, if I put another sheet of polarizing film in front of the polypropylene part, but before the camera, then what we're doing here is we're we're effectively cancelling out the polarised light from the light source, so you should get nothing. I mean, the polarising sheet is not that great, so you won't get nothing, but what happens is something very cool.
This is caused by something called birefringence, and it's actually complicated because not only crystalline stuff does this, the plastic can do this under stress even if it's not crystalline. So yeah, there's at least two reasons in this case with polypropylene that it's showing these colours. Intrinsic semi-crystalline structure of the polymer, which is what made me look at it in the first place, but it will also show the stresses that were cooled into the plastic. It's just something I found out about along the way, and I thought, I'll try that. And what do you know, it works. And it's another excuse to show you something cool through a macro lens. So this is all good and well, but how is it going to help us get polypropylene to stick to the bed? Short answer, it doesn't. Luckily, there are options, which we're about to go through. So I hope the people who skipped forward are back with us now, because we're getting serious again. Option one takes advantage of the fact polypropylene sticks to almost nothing except for itself. I mentioned at the beginning that polypropylene is ubiquitous, and it happens to work to our advantage. So many things are made of polypropylene. If you happen to have anything made of polypropylene lying around, then congrats, I guess you can use it as a print bed. But luckily, normal, clear, wide, sticky tape usually, but not always nowadays, because you've got these eco-friendly ones coming into the market, but usually if you buy the cheap stuff, it's made of polypropylene. So that's what people have been using since forever as a print bed. If you go for decent quality stuff, I know I just told you to go for cheap stuff, but if you go for stuff that sticks well, and I recommend that you obviously check its polypropylene, so the one I'm waving around in front of the camera, it is really sticky and I had zero problems sticking it to the zero bed here. I didn't think it would stick this well, because traditionally you would stick it to glass and it prints fine, so problem solved. I'm actually not kidding. This is the easiest, simplest, most foolproof way to print polypropylene in my opinion. But we like options, so we'll carry on and we'll cover the other ones. I bought these sheets because I thought they would be more convenient than the, the tape because they're being the right size for the bed, or at least you can cut them down to the right size for the bed, and they aren't because on PEI sheet they didn't actually stick as well as the tape, so the print will stick to the sheet just fine, but the glue of the sheet isn't strong enough to stick to the bed. I had a feeling that this might be because the bed isn't glass, as I just mentioned, so I tried sticking the sheets to a bed that already had the tape on that stuck, if that makes sense, so it was working like a smooth surface between, basically because I couldn't be bothered getting any, any glass, and also you can't use glass on the Sovol Zero because it's got a, an eddy probe, and any printer that has an eddy probe or an inductive probe, yeah, you, you've got to use a metal sheet. So unless you can get a plain metal sheet or a, or a plain PEI, which I still don't think these things would stick to, the best option is just to find better sticky tape, I think. Next up is something gooey, uh, Magigoo. Magigoo isn't the only adhesive out there, but I think it might be the only one that makes a specific blend for polypropylene, which I think is important because judging by the colour, hmm, it's probably got PP in it. I mean, it makes sense. Polypropylene likes polypropylene. What this stuff enables us to do is look at another MSDS, since we like doing that so much. And well, nothing spectacular really, except the advice to use basic PPE, which doesn't stand for polypropylene equipment. It means gloves and spectacles cover your eyes, apparently get this stuff in your eyes, you're going to be having a bad time. The stuff did initially fail on the first try, but that was because I forgot how much polypropylene really hates sticking to anything. It seems if you want to use it on a textured bed, you have to get it on thick enough that it covers all the texture. It is that fussy. So I, I did that, I put a couple of layers on and I made sure it was nice and thick, and then it works pretty well. It hangs around for multiple uses as well, it doesn't come off with the part, and I think as a result it's probably slightly more durable than sticky tape, at least in my experience. And it also is water soluble, so you can wash it off with just soap and water. Final option, without getting into testing random things, um, is the one that kicked off this whole video actually. Someone on Discord told me about the existence of these Prusa beds, and Prusa sent me over one of them, along with a bunch of other beds. There's also a bed for nylon, and we'll get to that in another episode. The polypropylene version is made of, well, 
I think it's actually powder coated polypropylene. I assume it must be just slightly more complicated than that because it doesn't melt at the same glass point as the polypropylene. It would be very bad if your bed started melting when you heated it up. But nobody else, to my knowledge, at this time has brought to market an equivalent sheet to this one. I suspect the more word gets out about this sheet, the more likely that is to happen. But for the moment, if you have a printer that this fits, then I think this is probably your best option. But we need to come back to that because when I tried the Prusa polypropylene sheet, I was actually initially confused because it just didn't work at all. But it turns out there was a reason for this. To print polypropylene, you need a fairly normal nozzle temperature, not that different to PLA or PTG. But what you do need is you need a very high bed temperature, like a minimum of 90 degrees C. This isn't so much because you need the temperature to make the polypropylene stick, it will probably stick to a cold bed, it's just more that you're trying to stop it warping. An enclosure I think is not 100% necessary in the same way as ABS because I haven't seen it cracking further up the print, and you do actually use normal fan speeds, but I think an enclosure will definitely help from the perspective of shrinking away from the bed, so it's not a bad idea. The reason though that the Prusa bed wasn't working for me was because this was actually the first test I'd done on the Core 1 rather than the Sovol, and thus I'd moved over to Prusa Slicer instead of Orca, and for some reason some of the polypropylene profiles on Prusa Slicer by default have the bed set to 0 degrees Celsius, and I have no idea why. As soon as I sorted out this bed temperature problem, everything was absolutely fine and the bed works just as well as Magigoo, with the advantage of this being not messy. Not that Magigoo is particularly messy, but you don't have to clean it off, put it back on again. You've basically just got the equivalent of a PEI sheet, but for polypropylene, and that's obviously great. Other than the harmless weird mark that every print leaves on it, it is fully reusable. Before we go into the print parameters a bit further, and I don't suggest leaving yet because there's still some important things that you need to know, let's talk about the video sponsor which is PCBWay. And if you want to use injection moulding for polypropylene, which is a service PCBWay offers for higher scale production, like a thousand units um, upwards, you would definitely want to be prototyping at home first and then letting the professionals handle it if you're going to go into production. Anyway, I've been working on a new board, this one, you'll be seeing this in use soon-ish, and I have a long list of videos I still have to make, including this one. It's a fairly simple all-in-one board to drive a stepper motor or two. I know we already have boards that drive stepper motors, they're called 3D printer main boards, but they kind of got complicated years ago, and if you don't want to learn all that, or if you just want to do something simple, which is essentially what I want to do, you can just do something like this and make a simple PCB to avoid having to do it on a breadboard like this. I used PCB Way to make this PCB, and the process couldn't be simpler. In fact, it's a lot simpler than doing it by yourself, because I actually tried to make a PCB by myself for the last video, and it worked fine, but it was a lot more effort. 
I've made quite a few PCBs now with PCB Way. Some of them have made it to videos, some of them are still waiting for videos. I think every single one so far has actually worked fine, and obviously that's because I do spend a lot of time checking them before I send it off, but also because it's actually not as hard as it looks, and really what arrives is exactly what you expect. I briefly covered the process of making a PCB from, from start to finish, and that was in the last sponsored video section, which was this one. And yes, I am actually telling you to go and watch another ad. So what? If you want to make your own PCBs too, and I highly recommend doing it because it's quite a cool experience and it's also really satisfying when it works, then go to the links in the description and use the coupon code there to get a discount. Thank you PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. Here's my calibration cube. It's not just useful for testing printers, which is what it was designed for, it also tells you a lot about materials. In the case of this Sunlu polypropylene, it's quite impressive. I think it comes out better than PETG. This was printed on the Prusa Core 1 and it uses a brim, as you can see, and that's the first point I want to make, which is always, always use a brim. You very rarely get away with not using brims on polypropylene. It's just not worth trying, in my opinion. Conversely, if you use one of the bed surfaces I mentioned and you do use a brim, then it very rarely fails, in my experience. The second point is overhangs are actually fine in most cases. The third point is the cube comes with two sizing test parts, a screw and a little peg, and you can see shrinkage in action here. The screw works fine and the cylinder part definitely has some slack in it because, well, shrinkage. Fourth, and this is the only thing I've seen so far that you might really want to consider when designing for polypropylene, thin walls do seem to cause problems sometimes. I don't think it's cooling. I want to say there's some kind of viscosity interaction here. It's pulling into itself. Maybe it's something to do with the contraction we talked about when, when you're shrinking. It's really strange and it's kind of unpredictable. It happened on this box catch and it happened every time I printed this model except when I printed only half the model when it didn't happen at all. So I think somehow you have to design to try and avoid these kind of situations, whatever they exactly are. I think probably avoiding any kind of thin parts, especially if they are tall. And finally, it's really cool to be able to bend these parts without them snapping. Polypropylene's main advantage is that it's virtually indestructible by deformation, as long as you aren't doing so along layer lines. You can snap the chimney off a benchy fairly easily, but if you have a long flat piece that you print out like this, you cannot destroy it by bending it at all. And this is the other reason we've got to this episode. This is preparation for the upcoming episode on compliant mechanisms. So polypropylene is really perfect for that kind of thing because it just won't break if you're using it in a compliant mechanism kind of design. So yeah, all that deduced from one test print. Whoever made this test print must have been quite smart. There might be something else you might have noticed on the test print too, a relative lack of stringing. Polypropylene is ostensibly not hygroscopic at all, really, which is what makes it great around water. And it means you don't need to dry it. You don't need to keep it in a dryer. When Prusa sent over that build plate, they also sent some PPCF, which is carbon fibre reinforced polypropylene. Now, I do suggest you go see a healthcare provider if you do get carbon fibre splinters in your PP, but the idea behind this stuff, at least some of the idea behind this stuff, is that it makes it easier to print because of the carbon fibre helping to secure the structure from warping. The properties of polypropylene already pretty much make it unbreakable if your design is oriented properly and done well. Maybe you might get some more layer to layer adhesion, I guess. This stuff does exist though if you're having problems with polypropylene, which probably is something you're going to run into more if you're doing bigger, more kind of hollow parts with steep walls, which is usually where you start seeing more warpage. So there you have polypropylene, I think. Did we manage not to get demonetized? Time will tell. Please remember to like and subscribe, especially if you want to see more of this, because this is, as I said, a prequel to an upcoming video on compliant mechanisms, where we'll be turning these things into actually bendy mechanisms, hopefully. Maybe that already happened, depending on when you're viewing this. Anyway, see you next time. Thank you for watching.